She spent over 20 years studying the dynamic relationship of countless business owners and their business models. She noted a common challenge that impacted the willing and committed, yet perpetually frustrated. She came to the conclusion that everything we thought we knew is wrong. My guest on Think Underground is business growth strategist Anita Larson of Lita Coaching. Anita, welcome underground. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. This is Think Underground, insightful and intelligent conversation with entrepreneurial giants, impact leaders, and titans. Coming up next on Think Underground. I'm excited to speak with you. Uh, I've done a little bit of reading on you, a little bit of research, studying you just a little bit. I, I read some of your content and you left me wanting more. You left me wanting to learn more and listen to you and learn from you because that that's a pretty bold statement to make. And there's a part of me that it really resonates with. And I get it. And I'm like, yes, let me get inside your brain. So let's go right there. You did spend, let's get right into it. You spent um, a, a fair portion of your earlier, let's call it your professional life, your career working in, in service of others. And during that process, you noted some common elements there that really are they, they really are, uh, you know, what do you want to call it? They're, they don't discriminate. They're just so common across the, the spectrum. But give us an idea of where you came from and how you came to this understanding. Sure. Um, you know, my background is in marketing, 20 something years in marketing, revealing my age here. But I started out working for brands, worked my way up um, until I eventually ended up working for a, a startup agency, part of the management team of a startup agency, which was exciting, a lot of fun. You always learn something new and you work with so many different businesses, so many different models, services, products. There's always something new, right? You're constantly learning, which is what I love to do. And um, what I did find during my time with the agency that when a company is at the point where they're ready to invest their marketing, invest in their marketing and start spending money behind it, everything else that's wrong in the business start popping up. All of a sudden you realize that, wait, maybe we don't have the tools or the resources or the skill sets in place to support this. Maybe we're not quite where we thought we were going to be with our budget, our revenue. Are, are we tracking what we should be doing? Do we have our tracking systems and metrics in place, our goals, our strategy, our leadership, our management? All of a sudden, there's this whole bucket of things that pop up that they didn't consider before they were ready to start putting marketing in place. And I guess one of the things that working for an agency or working in marketing overall, you're hired to handle that specific marketing project. And you can't make that successful unless everything around it is successful. I mean, you can't at some point, but you can make it so much more successful if the other areas of the business were fixed. So that's kind of where I am now. And it's part of what led me to doing what I do now. I can help take care of the whole picture, not just a little piece, but make everything else around it work better. So your marketing can perform immensely better and uh, set you off on the right track. I, I can I can hear right now the future clamoring of every uh, you know marketing agency out there going <laughs> say it sister you know what I mean they right. they are how frustrating is it that we have a client or a potential client that comes to us saying I think I need this and we by default go sure we'll sell that to you. Mm -hmm. versus I think I need this. And then we say, are you sure? Let's have a look first under the hood of who you exactly. really are. And then they sign on the dotted line. And then as you just described, everything starts to bubble to the top and you're like, this is going to be a nightmare. Like, yeah. what are we going to do? And, and I'm not here to rain on the parade of the entrepreneur. It's just part of the evolution. So let's dive into that a little mm -hmm. bit. In my life, in my understanding, I've segmented a little bit some of the avatars of who you've been describing. Mm -hmm. And that could be the solopreneur who's maybe a technician who is really good at their craft yeah. and just wants more, thinks that they can scale or wants to scale. We'll talk about that person and those wonderful wide eyes, but some of the realizations that we come to later. Yes. There's also the person who's sort of 
already uh, not a solopreneur, not sole, not a sole proprietor, but has a business model that's already sort of mid scaling and they're struggling to mm-hmm. scale. Right. I've got some of that compartment compartmentalized. And then separately, really, there's the well-funded, well-oiled system in place, well-capitalized organization. These are all business owners, but they're at different stages in their life and in their evolution. Yeah. You talk about the higher, the, not necessarily the hierarchy, but the journey from adolescence into maturity. Let's get into some of that. Yeah, and not even necessarily just that, because you can find those those businesses that feel like, you know, that they're on their way. They feel like they have everything in place. You start digging, there's there's always some fun, fundamentals that are missing that can be improved on. And, you know, a lot of times it just takes that objective eye to come in and, you know, and, and look at it, really, and just start digging and start talking to the people within the business and find out what the goals are and, and see where's the opportunity for improvement? Where, what do we need to do to make you scale? Like, where can you go from here? So there's a few things that that, I'm, that are actually percolating in my mind. There's somebody mm-hmm. who's already, they think they've tried everything else and they're ready to listen. There's others who think that they, you don't know my business. What could you possibly teach me about my trade? And yet I'm coming to you for marketing. There's others who say, I'm coming to you for marketing. Take my money. You handle it. Call me when you're done. Talk to me about the relationship that's required in business growth and scaling because you are a growth expert. You are a mm-hmm. growth strategist. I know your background is in marketing, but in order for you to take any one of those, pick one or, or come up with a different uh, um, description of the avatar if you want to, mm-hmm. if, if I'm going to go from where I am to where I want to be, tell me about my journey, inter- my internal journey that I need to come to, to, to accept. Yeah, you, you're 100% right. It's definitely an internal journey because you have to be open to have somebody come in and, and give you advice, right? And, you know, as business owners, we're we're all sometimes resistant to that because we do take pride in what we do and feel like this is our baby and we want to coddle it. But at some point, you know, you have to get outside influences involved. You can't protect your baby at all times. So um, it has to be that, that level of open-mindedness and being open to change and open to outside advice, that's key. Um, and also recognize that, you know, uh, business evolves, technology evolves, platforms come up every single day. There's always new things that maybe you didn't know at the time you launched it, right? So there's always room for improvement in any business. And if you have somebody come in and look at your business, they don't have to be an expert in your industry. They have to be an expert in business and how you run a business efficiently. Because business is business, no matter what you sell or what service you provide. I actually have a great example. Somebody I work closely with said that uh, he was sitting down with a a prospect, a, a lawyer in a law firm. And he's like, okay, well, this all sounds good. But I mean, what experiences do you have with the law? And my friend says, well, you passed the bar exam. Why, you know, I hope you got that covered. I'm here for your business and you handle the law. So, and that's very true. I I don't need to know what's going on to that level in your industry. High level, sure. Trends and overall high level research. But the business is what the focus is. I think I think that's phenomenal. I love that analogy. I've got a similar one, and, and to me, in the skills in the skilled trades, uh, this is I believe fairly uh, prevalent as as a frustration, and that is that you have a mechanic who's working in the bay, working on the vehicles, and is an absolute magician when it comes mm-hmm. to figuring their way around a vehicle. They can, they can change the brakes, they can change the transmission, they can do it all. And there's nothing that they don't know because they've been doing it generationally at home in the driveway and they turned it into a skill set that and they're getting paid a good dollar for it. Mm-hmm. And nothing frustrates that individual, that technician more than seeing the clean white press shirt of the person running the front office who owns the franchise or the model. And they came out of college and they or they got their MBA and they don't know the first thing they don't know the difference between 
an axle and a muffler or whatever, whatever description you want to give. And clearly you can tell I, I'm not that person either. Right. <laughs> <I'm> uh, <you. laughs> yeah, but it frustrates them because they're the skill, they're the talent and they're getting a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're seeing the person who's got clean hands in the front office who's dealing with handling the cash and the transaction and the relationship. And they're the one who has a successful business because in fact, they don't just have one location. They've got five or they've got 10 or they've bought a jurisdiction, a territory, et cetera. And you see that person time and again, who walks into the front office at the end of the day, or maybe they broke their knuckles on trying to mm -hmm. free a bolt. And they said, I'm done with this. I want to be the owner. Cause I know more than the owner does. And they go out on their own. They sign a contract with Snap-on Tools or somebody for $100,000. They sign a lease on a building and they say, I'm going to do it myself. And they're bankrupt in six months. Yeah. And we see that time and again. Yeah. So talk to me about somebody who wants to go from being that self-employed. They, they have a business that owns them but they're tied to that business and they want to grow and scale. What does that journey look like? You know, it's funny. I actually have a blog post like sitting in my computer right now that I haven't even posted yet. That's talking about that. You know, the two types of business owners, mm -hmm. one being the employee that really has a lot of trouble transitioning into becoming the CEO of their business and they just end up doing everything themselves. So in, in, in your case, it would be the, the mechanic that feels the need to still be that type of, have that type of involvement in their business and don't necessarily knowing how to run the business as a business owner. And then the other type of business owner being the CEO that doesn't necessarily have the business experience, experience right? So it's kind of the exact opposite. So um, I think it's, that's where you need that outside help. You need to set the foundation. Like if you're ready to start a business and it's a passion. It's like you said, it's it's a skill set that you hone. You know this. You can do this. You can you can do it better than anybody else, except you don't know how to run it. That's when you need that outside experience and need somebody to help you set those right foundations in place and expectations. So let's talk to the individual who's listening today who might be in that position where they've they've they're either working for somebody and 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 they do an amazing mm -hmm. job and they've just got ambition, they've got a goal, they'd like to go beyond where they are, or they're self-employed, which means they're they are everything. They are the CEO and they're also the person taking out the trash and they're the one cleaning yeah. the toilet and whatever else they're doing, the, the bookkeeping, et cetera, at the end of the day on weekends and evenings, et cetera. In all the glory of business ownership. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to that person for a second about growth and scaling. And and I'm gonna plant the one word. I've just got one word that was in my mind that, that came up as you were speaking. Uh, one word, it might not be the only word, but it's the one that certainly jumped in my mind. And it is the word delegate. Mm. Yes. Talk to me about the person who's going from sole proprietorship and really being their own boss and employee at the same time to scaling and the importance of delegation and what that really means. It is so important. And I know it is so difficult for, for that person. You know, you feel like you're giving up pieces, that you're giving up pieces of your business to grow it further. You know, it's, it's just, it's to get to that place and to be able to scale. Again, I'm going to go back to the foundation of your business. You got to know what your processes are. You got to have your systems in place so you can easily transfer some of these tasks to new resources that you bring in. So, it, you know, it takes the load off the training. You have everything in place. You know how things are supposed to work. And then being open to feedback as you get new personnel into those roles and having the ability to step back and let it work, right? Be available, be accessible, be supportive for new resources you have coming in, being open to their ideas, but also take charge and make sure it's still going in the direction, reaching the goals that you have set because it's still your business. So just knowing that you're not giving up your business is, is, there, is there growing it. it. Sorry, I apologize for walking in. 
is there truth to the saying or the the mantra of fail forward? Oh, a hundred percent. I I agree with that completely. Uh, fail forward, fall forward, just keep going back up, and every step you take brings you closer to the goal. Absolutely. You and you know any anybody that's in a business know you're going to fail. You're going to have so many failures down the road, but if you don't fail, you're not going to know what works and what doesn't work. There, you know, there's another saying, there's no fa- success without failure. Also very true. You you have to fail forward. So you got to take the risk. You got to take the, chance, the chances and just kind of evaluate where's your risk level. You know, how, how far are you willing to fall, you know, without it hurting your business? So, so uh, fair to say though, the first step in scaling really is acknowledging that you're going from one to at least two. And we talked about delegation, growth and scaling. It can be as simple, not simple, but it can start with growth by one. It doesn't have to start at growth by 10, right? So, yeah. So the first thing that comes into play there beyond, even before delegation, is accepting the idea of the role of HR. And I don't mean hiring an HR manager, but you're now dealing with another individual. Yes. What are some of the most common misconceptions or, and and again, because I'm, I'm building off of the comment that I read earlier that said everything you thought you knew was wrong. And then I don't, that may not be about your entire business, but there's certain, that certainly is going to ring true in certain components. And one of those components that is most challenging for many business owners Mm -hmm. is that personnel element. It is because you're taking on additional costs, additional expenses. And and like you said, it's not only the expense of the resource you're now hiring, but it's uh, potential HR support for that person, payroll solutions potentially for that person. So there are expenses to come with that. So make sure you have done your analysis, you've done your budget, your projections, you know what's coming up and that your new resource is going to support and help you meet the goal you set for that. Hmm. That's so, part of it. so with that in mind, you're bringing somebody on, you're not messing around. You're, you're now, your dream is impacting somebody else's livelihood. Yeah. They've got to pay rent or a mortgage. They maybe have mouths to feed mm-hmm. outside of their own. There's some liability. There's some responsibility. Uh, the whole idea of capitalization. I've got a dream. I want to grow. I want to go from one to two and two to five and whatever mm-hmm. it may be, but you've got to be capitalized to do that. What are some of the common things that you're seeing there? So what are some of the frustrations that you're seeing with your clients around that initial step into growth? Yeah, if we go beyond the financial aspect, um, I think one of the biggest issues I see in this phase is building the culture. Uh, and especially, I think, in the times we're in now, all I hear is I have such problems hiring and retaining employees. It's everybody. That's what I hear these days. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of culture are you bringing them into? What makes your company special to work for? Why should they come and work for you? And why should they stay with you? How are you setting things in place? And it, if you have somebody, a business owner that says that, you know, I, I just can't find the right person. Nobody's working out. I've gone through X number of people. Well, at some point, it's time for a little self-reflection. <laughs> like, you know, what's going on here? Do you Are these the criteria you really need for that job? Like, why is this person, these people not working out? Maybe take another look at your job description. Take another look at the culture within your company. What support system do you have in place for them to thrive in the position you want them in? So I think mm-hmm. that's very important at that point is culture, training and development, and uh setting the right expectations for those employees. Wow. Anita, you're giving me, you're giving me a bit of a problem here because I just wanted to go from where I am to where I want to be. And I just wanted to make a lot of <laughs> right? money. You're telling me it's not We're that simple. nonsense, right? <laughs> what, what's going on here? So, uh, but, but on that note, you're talking about culture. You're talking about, you know, maybe you're the common denominator in that scenario. If things aren't working out, mm-hmm. tell me a little bit more though, about something that we touched on just offline before we started today, which was the differentiator. Yeah. So I kind of mentioned the differentiator now, if you're hiring somebody, right. It's just as important 
I am of the strong opinion that every business can find a unique differentiator in whatever market they're in. It may take some time. It may take some work, a lot of research and innovation, but you can find it. And that goes to hiring employees as well. Like what differentiates you as an employer that would want people to come work for you? So it goes as, as, a, as a company and getting customers to come to you as well as employees. Um, I mean, I want, I want to challenge people a little bit here, if, yeah. if you will. Um, uh, you know, one of the areas that we see a lot of marketing and advertising in, in the space is certainly in the real estate profession. Uh, but mm-hmm. you also talked earlier about lawyers in, in one scenario that you were talking about. But I could line up 10 of anything. I could line up 10 plumbers. I could line up 10 realtors. I could line up 10 lawyers. Mm-hmm. We all have an LLB or whatever your, your accreditation is. We all have the certification or the designation. They've all passed the bar if they're lawyers, as you right? To, right? Um, we've all theoretically got access to the same services or software or tool or suppliers. Mm-hmm. Every plumber has a wrench. Every plumber's got access to the ABS pipe or the shark bites or whatever it is for the fittings. Maybe they're gas fitters or welder or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. They've all got opportunity and they all come to the table with essentially offering similar services. It might be new installation. Mm-hmm. It might be renovation. It might be clogging, unclogging drains, but they're all 10 plumbers. They're all 10 lawyers or they're all 10 realtors. Right. More often than I not than not, I see a realtor saying on their billboard, thinking of buying or selling, call me. And I'm like, great. Mm-hmm. You just said the same thing that every other realtor can say. Yeah. If I lined up 10 of anything, give me an idea of what a differentiator isn't and what a differentiator really is. Oh, that's a that's an easy question. A differentiator, okay. a differentiator is not. I've been in business for 30 years. I, my professionals are certified. All my realtors have a, their license, <laughs> you know, that's not a differentiator. Those are expectations. So if you see any ad and you're like, yeah, I think so. I would think so. <laughs> then that's not a differentiator. So I have quality service. I, um, my pricing is good. And that's another point. Pricing is hardly ever a differentiator. And, it, and if it is... Doing? If your if your differentiator is I'm the cheapest, you're two red flags. A business. You're putting yourself out of business, or you're sending a message that says you cut corners. One or the other. I don't know which right. one it is, but it is that is one of the biggest mistakes, and we hear yeah. it all the time. My price is the best; nobody can beat me. I'm like, I'm not hiring mm-hmm. you because of that. Yeah, exactly. So, so this isn't the, the what you're not, the how you're not different is an easy question to answer. I have a feeling that how you are different takes a little time and introspection that you talked on earlier. It does. And it's an exercise I go through with all my clients when we first start working on together. And it takes a while. It, it's not an easy task. It's It takes research. It takes an in-depth look at you, your values, your business mission and vision like where do you want to go long term how do you want to service your customers how do you want to support your employees it's really digging deep to find out who are you as a business and i know that as business are no i just want to go out there and sell my things why do i have to, like you said before what's all this extra stuff why are you wasting yeah, my time right. with all these silly right. questions yeah it sounds then, to me anita that that you're it's what i'm hearing is that there's at least on your clients you're, especially when you're introducing yourself to your client mm-hmm. there's an expectation that we're about to enter into some pretty uncomfortable conversations together oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's the thing it's not a is not a superficial relationship. Like I will not work with just anybody. If I, you know, if we have personalities that don't mesh well, I wouldn't work with you because it would not go well because it is a very personal relationship. And of course, again, like I said before, you have to be open to change. You have to be open-minded. So there's, you know, it has to be a mutual, uh, mutual respect for one thing and uh, liking each other, plain and simple. You're going to spend at least... Uh, you know, an hour or two a week together for hopefully a long time and just work on your business. And I think as business owners, we 
miss that person. We didn't re- realize we needed that person until we have it. That mm. person that knows everything about your business and you can tell them anything. They won't judge you. Mm-hmm. They will hold you accountable and they will give you advice. But, you know, if, if uh, somebody comes up to you and friends and family and say, how's your business going? You know, it's great. It's fine. You know, you're never going to tell them what's really going on. But to have that person where you can tell them all the mistakes you made today, it's invaluable. I'm going to insult somebody right now. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say this point blank. When your friends and family ask you how your business is going, just say it's going fine and change the conversation. Because the last person you probably want to take advice from is your friends and family. And there's a reason for that. That's not me being a jerk. That's me saying 85% of the population is not in business. They work for somebody else. They're an employee. They have nothing that they can offer you. They probably don't have their own payroll system. Now, you might have someone in your circle who is a mentor and who does qualify. They've had payroll. They've had your challenges. Great. That's a different scenario. and, and Mm -hmm. And I, of course, defer to that expertise. But- Talk about the fact that if somebody is going from employment into business or self-employment into business and from business into scaling a business, I have to believe that this can also build some pressure in the relationship, whether there's a spouse involved or a partner involved. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to have some some additional friction and tensions that come on board there. Talk about some of that. Uh, You know, some of my clients, their spouses are like my biggest supporters. (laughs) You know, it takes a lot of pressure off of their back because now their their business owner spouse have someone to vent to, to relieve all the stress to, and it's not them. So it actually helps take some pressure off the relationship. And also another thing that I would do is making sure that they have time for their spouse. Like what are they really focusing on in their business? Are they prioritizing what they should be? Do they have time scheduled with their loved ones or is all the time going to the business, you know? So usually the spouses are very grateful if I'm in the picture because they get time back, then they get good time, not the bad business time, right? So... Absolutely. So now your background is coming from a mark, an area of marketing expertise, mm-hmm. and you saw some of the common things. So we've we've touched on it, and I want to be fair. Not everybody who is likely to want a coach is just starting in business. In right. fact, if I was a business owner and, and scaled, and 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 I was at a CEO level, and I had a number of people, it, it kind of gets lonely. The higher you climb the 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 ladder, so to speak. I need somebody to talk to. So there's mm-hmm. there are startups and then there are established people and they still are suffering some of those common elements and that are frustrating their growth. They yeah. still need someone to talk to. What are we doing differently with an established business owner than somebody who's maybe in their, you know, under a million dollars or in their first couple of years? What are we doing differently? It all depends on what's going on in the business. Like every company or business owner that I work with you know, we sit down, we do, uh, I had them do a self-assessment, like rate yourself in all these areas of the business, just because it really opens up for a lot of conversation. So I can see how they view their business. And um, then I also have them do a, um, a software process that I take them through to really gauge the financial impact on some of the things we should be working on and strategies they have or have not in place and how we can improve them so we can see okay where could you be by this time next year or potentially five years from now if you work in these areas and based on that I will put together a customized roadmap but based on what's going on in that person's business so there are a couple of things I would do regardless of what stage the business is in which is the differentiator very few businesses already have that in place, or it could be, mm-hmm. you, it could use some improvement regardless. And mm-hmm. the second thing is looking at the expenses and cutting costs. And, you know, is this really an expense that helps you grow your business or is it beneficial for your business? So just getting an objective eye on that and kind of establish those habits to look at that on a regular basis. Those are two things I would start any business with, regardless of what face or what stage they're in. But so, everything else all depends on what's what the problems are in their business and what we uncovered during the first assessments. So so I'm 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 really excited. I'm enthusiastic. I'm ready to get going. I'm talented. I'm a great technician. I can do it all. I can cover mm-hmm. it all. I can 
what makes me great? I can do everything from A to Z is one business owner. And then there's a business owner that says, I could do everything from A to Z, but I specialize in G. I specialize in this one thing. What, what are we telling the people who are excited? They want to grow. They want to get, I, if the phone rings, my answer is yes. There's no job too big, no job too small. I do it all. What's the downside of that? Well, I'm sure everybody here says you have to niche, right? Uh, so the specialist is the one that's right in this picture <laughs> and the one that feels like they can do it all. And yes, I hear it all the time. And I know you probably do with what you do as well. And a lot of business owners feel like, okay, but if I niche, I'm going to lose out on all these other customers. It's not like you're going to lose out on them. They're still going to be there. They're still going to come to you if there's a need for you. What you're niching in is how you are putting yourself out there and where you're focusing your efforts. You can't, if you have, throwing out numbers, if you have a $10,000 marketing budget, you can't spend that on 20 different things. You're going to get so much out of each of those 20 things from the same amount of budget. If you put $10,000 behind the one thing that you specialize in, that you are really, really good at or where you differentiate, you're going to get so many more sales than you would if you spread it across 20 different things, right? What's that one thing that you're the expert in that you will be top of mind on everybody's, in everybody's mind mm -hmm. on, right? That you're, that you're the expert in. What's my differentiation? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> pretty, pretty much. That's, no, that's that thing, that's that right. thing that you're telling us, yeah. though, right? That's what you're telling the business owner, right? What's mm -hmm. my differentiator? Where, where am I the master at? And sure, once I get inside the door, and have mm -hmm. a relationship with you, you might learn that there's some complimentary services that I can offer you. But what's that one thing that I'm going to put? So talk to me about the marketing mindset that you bring to that. Yeah. That business owner. Yeah. And that's actually, I'm glad you picked up on that because that's always, even when that's all I did was marketing, that was always my differentiator because I started out working for really customer centric brands where the customer was always first of mine. Um, yeah, they were they were the number one. The customer could never do anything wrong. So I started out with a very customer centric mindset, and having worked for brands, and then having worked for from on the agency side, seeing that side of it, working with agencies, working for an agency as an agency, and then having my own agency and consultancy for a while, I've sort of seen every side of the coin. So I can kind of see, I get the whole perspective. I get the customer side of it. I know the consultants and agency sides of it. And I know the client side of it. So I can give that objective advice and truly be that one person that sees the full picture and have an objective opinion about it. And I've just seen that that has been so valuable to my customers. And it's, you know, now I'm going to throw some shade. So I apologize to anybody to take offense, but... With the times we're in now, everybody wants to run their own business. They want to be freelancers. They want to work from home. They want to be digital nomads. And some people are amazing at it. But there's also a lot of people that should not be doing it. And uh, I've seen some of my clients that come across many of these people and just really been taken advantage of where uh, you know they end up changing their whole marketing system because now this consultant gets an affiliate fee for what they've moved over to, but it was completely unnecessary and you know over and over again. And um, for them to have that objective advice or they can tell them, don't do that. You need to own this piece of it. Don't give that out to a consultant. And you know, you got to take control of it yourself and and really help guide them through those challenges. Mm -hmm. I think that's invaluable. I think that that is some great advice and to anybody listening. I mean, you went ahead and threw a little bit of shade. I'm going to double down on that shade. <laughs> You'll see it too, right? I'm just going to say it right now. Just because you know how to use a graphic design piece of software or just because you have a friend, sister's uncle's aunt who's on yeah. social media doesn't make you or that person an expert and doesn't make you a marketing expert. It makes you good at graphic design doesn't mean you had a business uh, degree that followed up on it or a financial acumen that followed up with it or whatever. So mm -hmm. there is a big difference. Anybody looking at hiring out some services or bringing on somebody, 
make sure that they're not only good at a skill set, but make sure that they understand and have the right questions to ask you in your business on what your objectives are and how you're going to get there. A strategy, a true strategy on how to get there. So let me let me go there with you actually real quickly. Uh, we talked about delegation. We talked about hiring. We talked about some introspection and looking about your management skill style and your your culture and and being properly capitalized and understanding the niche that you're going to go after in your business. We covered a lot of ground here in a short period of time, but tell me now the difference between hiring in-house versus outsourcing in different areas. Where, where do you want to hire in-house and where do you want to outsource it? And and the the answer, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not telling you that you should be outsourcing. I'm asking you if and when it's, it's the right idea. I think it depends on the goals of your business. Where are you going to be focusing your time, right? Uh, I mean, in most businesses, if you're a business owner uh, and you're looking to grow and scale, hiring somebody for sales or business development is going to be key, right? Because that's going to free up your time. And if you find a good person that can do that for you full time, that's immediate ROI. Mm -hmm. There's no way around it, right? Uh, Say on the marketing side, if it's a very specific thing, if it's a project, don't hire somebody full time to do that. If you're looking for somebody that's going to be your marketing operations person that can do a little bit of everything and be your right hand to get stuff launched, you could go either way. If you have enough work for a full time position, yeah, bring that person in full time. But if you're looking for somebody to just set up big Google Analytics uh, one time, then obviously you hire a freelancer to do that. So it really depends on the goal of your business and, and, and what stage you are in your expansion as well. Okay. So I'm going to poke the bear a little bit more there, though. <laughs> yeah. What's my role as the owner? And, and, and maybe there's a part two to my question. Maybe I'll give it to you now anyway, because I heard something really interesting and I'm sorry for doing that to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. But one of the hardest things is letting go as, as, a, as a solopreneur or the expert technician or the expert, a former implementer transitioning to business owner. It's hard to let go. Mm-hmm. You talked about that first role that has the greatest ROI is finding that salesperson. I'm going to tell you this. I'm still looking for that great salesperson, mm-hmm. right? It is a hard, hard position it is. To, to fill and to find somebody who's going to know what you know with the level and depth of knowledge and mm-hmm. passion, enthusiasm and expertise that you know, but also the passion to go out and sell it and convey the why me, why you want to hire me type of thing. That's hard to find in somebody else at the best of times. So if I'm the business owner Mm -hmm. and I'm hiring a salesperson or a business development manager to be that thing, what am I doing? You are training and developing and installing the passion into that person and realizing, yeah, you know what? During that transition period, you're going to take a hit until this person can fully get up to where you need them to be because it is a transition there's no doubt about it but your role as a business owner is to make sure you find that person and train them to get to where they need to be and give them all the tools they need to do their job well right and of course everything else that comes to running with the business you go out there and establish those great long-term relationships you look at what other products and services can you do you look at your strategy going forward your um exit strategy hopefully at some point you're going to have an exit strategy where am i going with this business i'm not going to sit there and work 40 to 60 hours a week you know for inter- eternity you know, at some point I got to get out of it. So that's, again, more important to find those people to put in place, whether you're going to sell or you're going to hire a manager to take it over for you so you can step back. And that really answers the question that didn't get asked, which is what is the difference between sole proprietorship and a business? Mm-hmm. A sole proprietorship, that exit strategy is going to be a tough one because are you just going to close the doors and walk away? You made enough. Yeah. What are you selling if you're selling it, if it doesn't come with you. And if you are the business, if you are the relationship, if you are the value of the contracts, you're going to have a different time selling it. Yeah. And and that's uh, another thing that I think a lot of business owners don't consider while they're in the deep of it. They don't consider their exit strategy and and where is this going to end up? I don't have time. That's a hard thing to think about it, right? 
Right. Uh, and it, it is really important to consider it because if everything rests on you, nobody's going to buy your business unless you come with it. And that's not your goal, right? You, you don't want to go with the business. If you're ready to sell, you want to go retire somewhere and be happy. Uh, so it's important if you're going to function as a business and have a solid exit strategy, make sure you have those systems and processes in place. Things can run without you. And you don't have, oh, another thing, you know, make sure not all your business rests on one customer. You have a diversity of customers and, and revenue streams coming in as well. So just a lot of considerations that you don't think about when you're in the business of it all. So if you could change the world, if there was one thing that you could do, just one thing that you could do to change the world, what would it be? Oh, that is a tough question. I always wish she asked me for if I had a superpower. What would be <laughs> well, you didn't come here thinking that the questions were going to be easy. Come on. Sure. Just a quick conversation is what I heard. <laughs> um, change the world. You know, I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's uh, peace and harmony and no conflict. That's all I want, you know, in business and in the world and in my life. That's that's the bottom line. I don't know how I could accomplish that personally, but it all starts with one person, right? I'll help you flesh that out then. What I heard you say <laughs> is with your skill set and the relationships you de- if you if that you develop, one person at a time, one business owner at a time, yeah. if you could help them with the questions and asking the right questions and exploring that journey with them to give them the know- the peace that they have the knowledge about how mm-hmm. to take on business ownership. That'll make better relationships. Yeah. That'll make, make better relationships in the yes. business community and their personal lives, et cetera. I'm, I'm all for entrepreneurship. I love entrepreneurship, but not for the sake of the word, not the hashtag, mm-hmm. but actually the true meaning behind it. And that builds communities. It puts food on other people's tables. It makes stronger communities, yeah. stronger children. And doing it because it's your passion and because you want to make an impact with what you do. Don't just, uh, you know, because I want to make the money, you know, that only takes you so far. No, well, thank and, you. Know, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say thank you for realizing that that's not an easy question to ask. That it is a tough question. I'm glad you struggled with it. To be honest with you, <laughs> it didn't just roll off your tongue. I'm I'm glad yeah. that it's that there's more substance to that question. Yeah, so. absolutely. Anita Larson, Lita Coaching. We can find you where. LitaCoaching.com would be the easiest place, or you can find me also on LinkedIn, Lita Coaching and Anita Larson. I want to thank you for taking the time with me. I think, I, I, I honestly believe we probably are left with more questions than answers. And I think that that Always. is, a, I think that's a good thing. I think yeah. it is a journey. It's not a once and done. I have enjoyed my time with you. I, I want to thank you because I am left with more questions than answers. <laughs> to me i probably want to speak with you again so i'd love to have you back on think underground with me in the near future anytime thanks for having me Irvi. this was great think underground is a siva creative incorporated production written and hosted by rf khan produced by brett glover with production assistance by samantha bowman cody fitzgerald william gibson music courtesy one and one music directed by rf khan executive producers mallory Steele and rf khan created by mallory Steele. 